And our second speaker today is Robert Owen, who is a biology major, chemistry minor. Uh, his thesis director was Dr. Lynn Boyd. And I will let, uh, I'll let Robert explain his thesis to you and, uh, and talk to you about uh, the process that he went through, and he'll respond to your questions as well. So, Robert Owen. Hello everyone, mine is not a tearjerker. <laughs> All right, hello everyone, thank you for having me. My name is Robert Owen, as Dr. Phillips says, I'm a biology major, I'm a chemistry minor, and I'm a pre-med student pursuing a career in medicine. I have the desire to do medical missions uh, one day, uh, locally and abroad, and I'm already actually, I actually, actually do, already do participate with those, I just want to expand my, my gift set and ability to help with that. So. Here we go. This is, again, nothing like the previous presentation that you saw. I uh, hope I can make it as, uh, as uh, emotionally and uh, lovingly uh, endearing as, as, as Hannah's was. Uh, great job, Hannah. By the way, that was beautiful. Thank you. All right, so uh, as you can see, there's more science words than there are uh, other English words on the screen. Examining the effects of manipulating chaperone-mediated autophagy on stress-induced nuclear granules. We affectionately call these SINGs. And we looked at those within the nuclei of oocytes of a worm, a nematode, called Cenorhabiditis elegans. Um, I will bring this home immediately. Uh, my mom last year was diagnosed with Alzheimer's, and it's uh, very, very challenging. Uh, we actually, on Thanksgiving Day this last year, we uh, lost track of her for 90 minutes and had to do a search, found her about two miles away, um, completely disoriented, and it's, getting, it's been pretty bad, uh, but this project uh, interestingly enough, has implications with research on curing Alzheimer's. Um, and so I'm very motivated with this, and hopefully, hopefully one day this research will continue and help provide therapeutic methods for that. So, um, and again, this is from my thesis defense, and I, I love any opportunity I can to thank uh, people, but Dr. Lynn Boyd, you'll see in the middle there, she's uh, the uh, chair of the biology department, if you don't know who she is, but she was my project advisor. A uh, mentor, a champion, she's really helped me and steered me, and she, it was her lab that I had the privilege of working in. And I'm always thankful for the All Honors College staff, as I know you guys are. They make a path for us uh, in the undergrad wilderness, and they advocate for us, and they, they cheer us on, they provide us resources and opportunities. I'm very thankful for them. Doc, and then Dr. Jason Jessen was my second reader. And then my family, who uh, cooks meals and does laundry while I'm studying, and note cards, and buried in the... Uh, in the lab. So, all right, here we go. So, threw a graphic in here to hopefully catch your attention um, sooner than later. But we're, again, with Alzheimer's, Huntington's is similar where you have neurons that are, are, are dying. They're not functioning properly, okay? So, Alzheimer's is usually related to memory loss, whereas uh, Huntington's is more about function and just, the, you know, motor skills. Parkinson's is similar. So, at the top, you've got a properly folded protein. So, our, you know, humans, we have thousands of different types of proteins. Uh, most people think protein is muscle. Actually, enzymes, um, everything, including transcripting DNA, our bodies are just filled with proteins, proteins, proteins. And what happens is the body has a self-recycling, healing process that it does when those proteins are either done with their purpose or some sort of damage happens or they just become obsolete. Maybe there's no need for them anymore. And then there's really kind of three fates, if you will. And so the project that I had tried to help characterize and isolate a specific uh, nuance of this. Again, if you're new with research, the whole planet, and we, we get to work with, lab, you know, interconnect with data and information from labs all around the world, everyone is just moving towards answers. And it's largely a massive deduction process. So if you take Alzheimer's, for example, there could be 10,000 questions that we need to find the answer of. We can't, you can't just throw a drug at it or test it on a human. You need to have all these things answered before. So my project is like, you know, subset A of t line 10,000. I'm answering a, a yes or no question that's way down here that's part of another. So I'm probably in the millionth level tier of, of answering a question. But it's still an honor, and we're actually gainfully answering this question uh, across the world. So that's, that's an, it was an honor for me to be a part of this project. So misfolded protein, the first fate you'll see here, this is a, this is a guy called proteasome. Um, there's papers out there that, that indicate that 80% of the 
cell or organisms, uh, proteasomes are in the nucleus, depending on what species we're talking about. And this is a recycling kind of a pa paper shredder type thing. So you'll see the misfolded protein comes in, spits it out, and then it's actually more energetically favor favorable for our bodies to recycle small subunits of proteins rather than make all new proteins altogether. That's actually very costly for us to trans transcribe that from DNA and translate it in ribosome. So we want to actually recycle them, and we, so we snip it in these little reusable, you know, polypeptide uh, packets. The fate on the right, that's, that's a big organelle. So if you're familiar with the nucleus, if you're familiar with uh, the ER or the Golgi, so lysosome is another org organ organelle, and it's just a digestive bag of enzymes. And so it's usually out in the cytoplasm. You don't find it in the nucleus, whereas proteasome is in the nucleus. And in the cytoplasm, um, this mis misfolded protein will get uh, grabbed by a chaperone. So you guys all know what chaperones are from middle school, right? The chaperone takes it to lysosome and drops it off and lysosome does a similar thing of paper shredding it and reusing those, those subunits. So our big enemy or our big problem is this middle guy right here. When a protein is misfolded, it actually becomes dangerous. So we have basically hydrophilic regions that are supposed to be kept inside the protein through the proper folding, get exposed on the outside and they start attracting other misfolded proteins. They clump together. They start, they're called protein aggregates. And these guys really raise the toxicity level of a cell, and that's how we'll see neurons die and problems and disease, and really a lot of pathology for a lot of diseases. Again, I'm focusing on Alzheimer's, but uh, proteins, again, are most of our entire body. So, all right, so proteostasis, that's a, that's a cool word. That's, that's a newer word. So you're probably familiar with the word homeostasis. So proteostasis is protein homeostasis. So again, to, to kind of say it a different way of what I've already said, it's just self-regulation. You make the protein, you use the protein, you recycle the protein. And that's just, just sort of this kind of health and healing uh, cycle in our bodies. And I've already, I've already referenced the medical significance, um, so I'll just, I'll just keep moving for time. Um, and so under normal conditions, I've talked about that as well um, with the recycling. Our three steps um, right here, ubiquitin proteasome system, that's the proper name for that. Autophagy is the name that the lysosomes use. Lysosomes actually have three types of autophagy, micro, macro, and then chaperone-mediated autophagy, which is what this project focused on. All right, and then just to bring it back home, just, in, just to reference it again. All right, so now this is a picture of what I just showed you of lysosome. So lysos big yellow guy on the right, let's zoom in, this is him. So cytosol is out is just the kind of the fluid inside the cell. That's just cytosol is all the liquid, cytoplasm is all the liquid with all the organelles. So in the cytosol, misfolded protein, chaperone identifies it, takes it to lysosome. And what we have, see these orange proteins called LAMP. So a lab technique called RNAi, it's ribonucleic acid interference. It's a really cool uh, technique. You can actually, we fed these worms, this RNAi, bacteria, and it interfered with transcription, uh, I'm sorry, with translation of the LAMP gene. And so we effectively shut off lysosome, chaperone-mediated autophagy function of the worm. Now, why did we do that? That's usually, if you're asking a binary yes or no question in the lab, then it's helpful to remove one of the possibilities to see if the other possibility happens. It's a very common uh, procedure. It's very simple. Again, feeding a worm a bacteria that shuts off some of its gene expression is not simple, but it's, it's, it's very, you know, as far as the pro procedure is very simple. So we turned off this orange guy, which means we have no more shredding, which means we have misfolded proteins that are not going to get recycled in the cytoplasm. We wanted to see what, what would happen with those. The next thing we did um, is, we, is we hit it with a high salt stress environment. And so now the worm is under, un, under salt stress. Uh, this is talking about the genes that we, talk, that we talked about with lysosome and with silencing that expression. Uh, the gene LMP1 and LMP2 are the two genes we knocked down. So the salt stress here, we hit it with 500 uh, millimolar sodium chloride, soaked it for an hour. And what happens under high stress? High stress more misfolded proteins happen. So we increase the number of misfolded proteins in the worm, we decreased its ability to handle those with lysosome, and we wanted to see would proteasome in the nucleus take over. Now why would you want to do that? Well, most drugs find ways to leverage the body's resources. The body has redundancies. Well, why would we take care of it 
in lysosome and in proteasome? Well, there's regulation happens at different levels. The way we process insulin, the way we process glucose, there's multiple redundancies so the body can handle stress, it can adapt to change, it can kind of reroute if something breaks, it can fix it kind of on its own. And so a lot of therapeutic uh, treatments will leverage some other aspect or one of those aspects if another aspect is failing. Does that make sense? So, hey, you might actually have a lysosome problem, Mr. Alzheimer's patient, so we want to give you a treatment that could upregulate proteasome activity and help you with these misfolded proteins. And so that's kind of a dreaming big and that's our, kind of our big hope and our big idea. So we stressed it. We have a, you know, previous examples of how this stress increases misfolded proteins. Sing formation is evidence of, of this uh, misfolded protein increase. Um, and that's how we're, that's how we're quantifying this, this, uh, this, these tests. Are you still with me? I know it's not adoption, I'm sorry. Um, we, have, we do have a family culture in our lab though it's very very lovely you guys should get involved uh, we have parties we uh... all right um, so our big question was uh, uh, yeah we don't tell stories for each other and, and get that personal I wish we did though that'd be fun um, does increasing the amount of cytosolic misfolded proteins increasing formation if it does then that tells us that proteasome is involved so that was our big question all right, here's our guy. So this is the pet of our family. Um, unfortunately, he doesn't get treated as well as uh, most pets, uh, unfortunately, but it's a small, you'll see one millimeter uh, nematode. It's an ideal organism. It, can, it goes from egg to adult in three days. Um, it's trans, transparent mostly, which makes it very, you can see m most all of it through the microscope. Um, and, you, and its genome is fully mapped. In fact, it was the first organism that had its genome fully mapped. We actually have the entire genome, and then we actually have a library that our lab purchased that's sitting in a minus 80 degree Celsius freezer over in the science building of every RNAi knockdown of every single gene of the entire worm in this freezer. And we can go in and pull out the library, and I got my little lysosome genes, and I pulled it out um, and grew it in a bacteria culture. So it's, it is, it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. Um, the strain I used was LN151. LN actually, from, that's from Dr. Boyd. She actually created this transgenic strain, which has a uh, fluorescent marker tagged to proteasome. So when we zap it with a laser microscope, it pops and you can see it. We can actually see inside the cell. It's amazing. So here we go. So distal oocytes, see the top? Those are all those little eggs, little oocytes. And here is actually a, a real image of that gonad. So I'll go back. Do you see how it's kind of a small area with the little oocytes? This is that under the confocal fluorescent mi microscope that we used. This was our vector, so nothing, no stress, nothing, no, no, you know, nothing done to it. This is normal. And I want to just point out, it, there's, there's sort of a smooth redness to it, in which, again, the red is the fluorescent marker on proteasome indicating it's, it's recycling paper shredding activity. All right, so now we stress it with salt. And you'll see, is there a laser pointer on this? Yes. All right, so this guy right here and this guy right here are what we again call SINGs, and that is a localization of protein quality control. There's misfolded proteins, proteasomes go in there, and they're just shredding through these, these uh, misfolded proteins. And so obviously that was again with salt stress, so we see that. Now, we knock down lysosome activity. So proteasomes on its own. And we saw more SINGs. So this is, these are representative ish, uh, images. And then we, so that was LMP1 right there. There's, 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 there's two of these. Uh, they, do the, they do the same thing, basically. And then the next one, even more. We knock down LMP2, and obviously you see way more sings. And then I'll give you a summary image here of all four to compare. So uh, as any researcher appreciates when your experiment works, uh, it's really great. I, I, unfortunately, it would be valid, but I would not have liked to come up here and say our experiment didn't work, but still have my thesis defended. But that's science, because guess what? I answered a no question, not a yes question, right? And so, but it's more fun when you get to actually answer. All right, so these are some boring stats. Um, I'll, I'll spare you the gory details of um, a lot of, I'll highlight basically a couple, a couple that are interesting things. Notice these numbers, 900, 900, 850, 20. I, I had to count 3,460 of those oocytes. 
I got to, didn't, I didn't have to. Uh, but it's, uh, the reason I point that out is because it, if, if I, I'm actually going to one day hopefully try to treat somebody with this, some sort, we give them a medicine, hey, take this pill, or I want to present this or publish this paper. You want data that you feel confident in. And so that we, had, we ran this at a high, high volume over three, over three trials. Um, and we did see a statistically relevant increase. We saw uh, an increase, 11.9% here, and a 9.7%. And then we did some lovely stats, an unpaired one-tailed z-test. That's just showing that it actually is statistically relevant. It wasn't just a little small uh, deal. This is, this is a significant change. Again, more statistics, confidence intervals, just saying that this interval between this error bar, that's actually not an error bar, it's an inter confidence inter interval bar is separate from this range. And so basically it's saying we're confident down to 1% that if it was wider than it actually was, it's still not with, it doesn't overlap with this. And then this guy compared back to here does not overlap. Again, just another way to say statistically relevant. Statistically relevant. All right. Um, conclusion, sink formation statistically increased in the nuclei of oocytes of worms exposed to environmental stress when those two genes, LMP1 and 2, were knocked down. Um, so I'll, I've, I've already kind of alluded to this, but I'll, I'll bring this home. Um, if, because there, there are papers that, and it's been conventionally held in science, that misfolded proteins do not get imported into the nucleus. There are new papers coming out in the last few years where we are now seeing evidence of nuclear import of, of these misfolded proteins. Again, that's huge. This further confirms that and supports that. And again, that brings it home to our medical uh, hope here, medical implications of of uh, creating a, you know, a therapeutic response to try to help leverage proteasomes. So if we could, if we could either help to import these uh, misfolded proteins or we could help leverage proteasome out into the cytoplasm, we would then uh, take care of these misfolded proteins and help them to get properly taken care of. So um, that is the basic summary of this and future direction. As all scientists, if you answer one question, great, elimination. We checked a box off our list. Uh-oh, we opened up three new questions. So you got to stay in the lab and try to answer more questions than you're creating. That's the hope. Well, unfortunately, I, I actually opened up three new questions. <laughs> um, we're going to compare it, knocking them down simultaneously. If you knock down one, there's papers that say out there that say the other one upregulates and kind of compensates. So again, we only saw like 12 and 10%-ish uh, changes. So if we can knock down both, we're expecting double, maybe exponential uh, differences. And then there's a small little adjustment that we would like to move, try is just comparing some further to confirm our results. That would just better support our data. Um, and then lastly, there's this new cool photo switchable fluorescent tag. We used MCherry, but there's one that actually can change colors in the cell if you zap it with a certain wavelength. Of laser, so we want to inject um, the, the organism in the cytoplasm with this with a with a protein that will change color if it goes into the nucleus, so we can actually you know visibly track the protein uh, nuclear import. So that would be really cool. So the chemistry department's uh, partnering with me, with me on that, and we've got some new projects to do for this next year. So that's exciting. All right, there's the references for this slide, and there was more obviously for my paper. So that was it. So thank you very much. <laughs>yeah, the, actually the lab, the Boyd lab is that first one on the left on the second floor, uh, close to the, the main administrative office. I've seen like a lot of vaults. Is that like where the, the freezer is, I guess? I mean, yeah, there's, uh, I mean, and there's, the laser microscope is around the corner that, you know, is, I don't know how many tens of thousands of dollars, but yeah, there's multiple pieces of equipment being used. It's, it's actually, that's part of why the privilege, uh, that I, sense of privilege that I felt was, 
the amount of money that's invested into the, our facilities and just to even have the organism to have the, 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 the RNA library to have the freezer itself, I mean, good grief. So, and be able to just use that and walk in there um, and be trained how to do it was a, was a big, was a lot of fun, learned a lot, so yeah. <clears throat> So I think I got lost in all the words, but yeah, whenever, <laughs> whenever you like knocked down like the lysosomal, did you actually see an increase of the proteins that went through the proteasome? Yes. That's what our data suggested. We would we would continue to like to confirm that. Yep. Somebody else? Oh, okay. Over here. Oh, sorry, yeah. Oh, well I know at this point you're working with nematodes. What would be the ideal next step up? And organisms to work with. Well, if you're talking to the worm folks, there's not an up. There's a, because theirs is the best. No. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's, there's zebrafish down the hall. Um, uh, the, Dr. Samputa, who mentored me, he, she, she just finished her PhD here at MTSU and just went to UNC for a postdoc. She's working with mice uh, now. And uh, there's mouse models that inform a lot of what we're doing. So, you know, part of why C. elegans is so popular as well is there's, I think it's like 80% of its genome is similar to humans. So there's actually a lot of, home, they call them homolog genes where there's a similar gene that has a lot of similarities to the human genome. So um, I guess my direct answer would be, yes, it would be great to expand it to other organisms to confirm our findings. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yep, thank you. Yes. I was just wondering, to what degree are you linked to other, other people doing the same, same research and other facilities and other schools? Yeah, great question. Um, the, our lab sends a team to California every year for the annual uh, C. elegans conference, and then we will reference papers from um, different labs that, that attend that. So um, it's primarily from a literature standpoint, but the, Dr. Boyd does have relationships and people that she talks to. Um, we don't do anything without referencing what people have done before as much as we can. I know journals are spit out at a large rate. It's hard to keep up, but we do everything that we can to do that. And it really, it makes our job easier if we know if somebody already answered a question or has a procedure that went well. I mean, a lot of these procedures were actually like what temperature we keep them at and you know, how much molarity do we st stress. That was all from pre other people's papers. Um, so yeah, hopefully it's a gainful cascading process um, that, that moves forward. So yeah, I hope that answered your question. But. Yeah, um, I did want to reference one thing uh, from a gentleman that asked, Dr. Phillips, if I may. Just w when I stepped into the thesis program, I, I was asked, what do you want to study? And when I got to the science building, they said, well, we can kind of steer you, but you really just want to jump in and learn how to do research more than what do you want to re re research. So, you know, my wife's a cancer survivor, so I'm like, I want to study cancer. I just want to cure cancer. Let's do it. And no, no one's really doing that here at MTSU. There's obviously other institutions around the world that, that do that, of course. But there's only really one small side project that, that is specifically about, you know, cancer. So I, I, was, I remember feeling mildly disappointed at first. Um, and then all of a sudden I realized, oh, my gosh, I am just an ignorant undergrad that really just needs to learn cell biology, molecular biology, and how to do research and just learn the process. So just a word of advice is just if you're pursuing it, uh, well, because I mean, Hannah's even talking about uh, the research component for her piece. And so some of it's just, my, I guess my basic point is just getting to learn how to do it from people who are already doing it here on campus. Um, people, you know, the, the PhD candidates I talked about and our professors are all doing research and have been doing it for years. And so I learned a ton. Some of my classes were a cake, a breeze walk this semester because I already knew half of, you know, they were being, they were taught, they were teaching because I learned it in lab or in this thesis project. So uh, just honor the process, respect the process, and, and one, one day I'll get to pick what I want to research and I'll be, I'll be thankful for that. So, so yeah, any more questions or how much time do we have, Dr. Phillips? I don't want to. Any other questions for Robert or for us about the thesis process or anything? Thank you.